Let's pray. Father, here we are. We gather up together to hear your word, to give you glory. Lord, to thank you for all that you've given us, done in us, through us. Lord, you are our life. Lord, we thank you for the ability to gather up like this, to, to talk about your word, to see what we need to do and the changes we need to make. So, Father, in Jesus' name, we just our, our main hope here is that you have pleasure in what is said, what is done, what takes place. So in Jesus' name, Lord, we give you this time and we just say, have your way, speak. Lord, just, I believe I know what you've given me to share, but at the same time, Lord, you know that we are here for you and that's what counts. So in Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you and we bless your name. Amen. 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 All right. Okay, well, I will tell you tonight I have an agenda. I don't normally... Yeah. <laughs> All right. We get a we get a planned message. No, <clears throat> not just a bunch of bunny trails strung together. No. Um, normally, I have a purpose, which the purpose is your growth, your you know this body, right? Well, tonight it's a little bit different because tonight we're going to cover uh, several areas, and but the main thing tonight is we are making some. We're putting some things out there, put it that way. We're putting them out into the atmosphere, putting them on CD, DVD, tapes, whatever, and get them out to people because um, <clears throat> this is something I believe needs to be, well, I just, you know, I should have included it in the prayer. I believe that this message tonight needs to go throughout all Christianity right now. It needs to be out there. So, a um, couple of things we'll be talking about as we go along. I have some, yes, yeah, so I want to give you, I want to read this to you. Here's. Just to let you know what's going on, here is uh, an, an email that I got. It says, Dear Brother Curry, I've recently come from a two-week missionary training course with Calvary International, and my host family gave me a book on the complete writings of John G. Lake. I also received a course book called A Basic Course in Divine Healing Part 1. Well, that's the old old DHD manual, like the first one, 97 uh, volume or whatever. It says, My heart is stirred, oh my. So, I thought, I mean, she even wrote it that way. I thought that's kind of neat. It says, Is there any way that I could purchase several of these course manuals so I can take my Bible study group through it? We've all been crying out for more understanding in the area of healing, and I feel like this is an answer to prayer. Since I picked up the course book, I have not been able to put it down. I'm not sure that, I'll, that I will go to sleep tonight. I'm hungry for more. Looking forward to your reply. God bless you. And this is actually in Florida. And I'm trying to find out exactly who it is, but yeah, we're gonna but we're gonna try to get her an updated version. So, um, which is, yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing. It's like we said the other day, if this message is getting into, um, you know, the Church of Christ, right, <laughs> and, and and making an impact there, then it's out there, amen. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, and it's not just being preached in the church. I mean, you know, it's not just preaching to them; it's affecting them and making change. So, Fabian. No, actually, they went down for a missionary training course down in Florida. And while they were there, the family they were staying with actually gave it to them. And so um, we're going to make sure that they, they get it. There was a, And then there was another one. Where is it at? Here it is. Yeah, it says, uh, Brother Blake, I wonder if you could help me with a couple of questions. First, I've been attending a class being held by one of the largest ministries in the country who will be holding an evangelistic festival soon here in my area. 1 Corinthians 11:31 and 32 and Hebrews 12:6 through 10 were referenced to support the teaching that God brings adversity into the lives of his children for their good. I know for certain after the teaching of JJ Lynn ministry that sickness is not one of the adversities he brings to teach. However, I'm not sure what things he does bring. So he's they're asking me a question and it talks about some some area, there's some personal things here too, but <clears throat> that is um, these are the kind of questions we get. So the good thing is you notice they said we've already been through the teaching, so we know that. So they they were automatically able to kick out the wrong and maybe absorb the right. But you see what I'm saying? So um, and the reason I'm reading these is it, it directly ties with what I'm going to talk about tonight. That one I have no idea what that. It, I don't know what that is. Anyway, <laughs> people listening on the CD or DVD are going to be thinking, "What is he talking about?" I got an email from somebody. I have no clue but it had something to do with fire school, but it was, I don't know, it was strange. Anyway, but it, it, they were writing to fire school, and somehow I got it. So, 
they probably copied it to me, but it was just strange. Um, I have to figure out what it is. So now I'm trying to get all this. I need a. I guess I should have got the big pulpit. Uh, in a little while, well, to what? We'll just go here. Yeah, yeah. You, you probably do. You you may need to. All right. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew chapter 22. <clears throat> now tonight's message. I am calling. Somebody's right. Somebody's wrong. All right. So just. Let that be stated uh, right from the beginning. That's where we're headed. Now, I want to ask you something. Let me ask you, I'm going to ask you three questions. Number one, do you believe in spirits, yes. such as angels, demons, etc.? Yes. yes? Okay. Do you believe in the resurrection? Yes. Right? Okay. Do you believe in the literal interpretation of the Bible? Yes. Okay? All right. You know, for the most part, I mean, obviously there's some s- symbolic language there, but overall, we live by a right literal interpretation, right? right? Okay, now, all right, in that, I want to say be careful because those are all the qualifications of a Pharisee. Every Pharisee believed in spirits. They believed in the resurrection and they believed in the exact literal interpretation of the Bible. And, <clears throat> which is not to say that that's wrong, obviously, because I'm gonna, we're going to go into it in some detail. And tonight, I'm going to give you some detail, but I really don't want this is not a theology class in Phariseeism, all right? I'm not going to detail the Pharisees and to, to too much, but I'm going to show you a couple of things. But I'm going to have to move kind of quick because we've got a lot of ground to cover, and I just don't know how to split it up. I've tried. I just don't know how. So we're, just, we're going to get it done, though. Now, the Pharisees believed in all those things. Now, the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. They didn't really believe in spirits. And... Now, they would say they believed in a literal literal interpretation, but they cut out all the parts they didn't want to make literal, right? So, if you look at it, it's kind of funny because, yeah, I remember when I first started training, I was listening to several different teachers, and one of them was Charles Capps, and he was talking about the power of the tongue and different things, but as usual. But the funny thing was, I'll never forget, whenever he started describing, this just stuck with me. You know, some things, the way they say things just stick. And he was talking about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And he said, the Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection, which is why they were sad, you see. And so, and so for some reason, that's how I always <laughs> separated the two. It's a good way to know. So, Now, in comparison today, the Pharisees were like the... And I'm going to have to give you some... Uh, let me back up just for a second. All right. We look at the Bible, and we look at Pharisees, Sadducees, and there were the Essenes, which weren't even really talked about. They were talked about, but not named. And... We look at these different groups, scribes, lawyers, people like that. Now, in Jewish setting at that time, it wasn't like, it was similar to like the Republican and Democratic Party in that there were some people who were very hardcore activists going after it. Well, those are the ones Jesus talked about that walked around in the robes and did that kind of stuff. But then there were others, really Phariseeism and Sadduceeism really was more of a mindset and you could find where you were based on your mindset and which viewpoint you looked at. So it wasn't just a clear cut, here's this group or here's that group. Now there were, you could tell them, you could tell the hardliners because they wore the phylacteries and they had all the stuff. So it was, there was some definition, but it's kind of like there were extreme Pharisees that Jesus blasted. There were extreme Sadducees that Jesus blasted. And then they kind of moved toward a center moderate area, kind of a John McCain, uh, no, wait a minute. Uh, it's a, they moved from hard line into a, into a moderate area. And it's kind of like they, they came together kind of in the center and there were these groups and they could take different viewpoints, you know, based on the topic at the time. Now, you say, what's that got to do with anything? Well, I want you to remember this. Pharisees came into being around 150 years B.C., so they had been around for as long as everybody could remember, right? They weren't just starting. They were well entrenched in, in Jewish society. People looked at them. They were the religious authorities of the day, both the Pharisees and even the Sadducees. It was just, you know, it was just two different... Because Israel was a theocracy it, and not a democracy, then obviously the legal, uh, political aspects had religion at the heart of them. And so you really can't 
divorce the two. They, they're right there together. So when you look at these, <clears throat> the thing to remember is that these people, everybody knew them. In other words, that was the status quo. That's the way things were. There were the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and then you had your independents out there. And just like today, even in the political realm, the two main parties were had the most power. One party had more power than the other. And yet the individual or the uh, independents, they made a lot of noise but had very little power. And they never really got much done, so they just kind of set themselves apart. And, and if you look at it, even the name Pharisees, and there's different... Uh, ideas of where they came from. There's some fascinating detail if you really start studying it. But where they came from, they were known, they called themselves the pious ones. And where they, now the other people, really called them, like today, various names. And But it was almost in derision. They called, they called people outside of the Pharisees, called the Pharisees the separated ones. Now the Pharisees said the pious ones were the holy ones. But the people outside the group would call them the separated ones. In other words, separated from the group, different. We would call them rebels, almost in a mindset of being outside there. Now, whenever what happened in this is that they, or just think about this. If we say separated ones today, we think Christians, saints, separated, right? Sanctified, separated unto God. Well, that's the way they thought. And if you look at what they believed... It's amazing because they really believed right. They really didn't believe anything wrong, per se. The whole problem was not in what they believed. It was in how they practiced what they believed. And the fact that they put, you know, and I hear this, I'm not, this is not, uh, I could go a different way with this, and I want you to know I'm not going that way, all right? They practice their religion in a way that hurt people, all right? Put them in a box. And they like things neat and orderly, which, you know, who doesn't, right? I mean, this, that's what I'm saying. Tonight really applies to everybody, and everybody should analyze themselves. But this is not so much to the person in the pew, even though you're going to look, hopefully you will analyze yourself, because the Bible tells us to examine ourselves. This is really, I'm sending this out here, because I hope that we can get this CD, DVD out in mass so that people can make copies of it at home and give it away. I'm, I'm hoping it just spreads. Because tonight I'm primarily talking about the ministry. The Pharisees were similar to the charismatic ministers today. All right, very similar. Uh, they were authorities. They were looked up to. They, they, but they believed what they taught. They just didn't practice what they taught, which is why Jesus called them a hypocrite. <clears throat> and Jesus even said it one time. Now, and I want to quote some things here. Uh, he told the people to do what the Pharisees told them to do. Just don't do what they do because they didn't do what they told the others to do. And so in Matthew 22, starting in verse 23, <clears throat> it says this, <clears throat> The same day came to him the Sadducees, which, is, which say that there is no resurrection, and asked him, saying, Master, Moses said, if a man die... Now you notice, the only reason it's told that they don't believe in the resurrection is because of the question they ask. If they hadn't asked that question, they might not have mentioned what they believed. So they were, they're letting us know, Matthew is letting us know why they asked that question. They were trying, that's, the Pharisees and the Sadducees were always trying to do one of two things. Enlist, prove to the people that Jesus was on their side and, and were with them, or disprove him. First they would try to gather him with them, and then whenever he blasted them, they tried to, push him aside, and blast him. Now, one of the things is, when we say Pharisees, we think bad. Automatically, oh, it's bad, no, don't want to be a Pharisee. That's not really true. You don't want to be the bad kind of Pharisee, but they were good Pharisees, right? So let's look at some of them. <clears throat> Verse 24, saying, Master Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother. Likewise, the second also, and the third, unto the seventh. And last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection... Stop right there. Do you see what they're trying to do? They're trying to pull Jesus into the argument over the resurrection. And they didn't believe in a resurrection. Right? 
These were not people trying to prove a resurrection. They were trying to say, they were trying to get this concocted story to say, see how ridiculous that idea is of a resurrection? And so they were trying to manipulate and catch. And if you go back to the beginning, it says the same day was because they hit, Jesus had just blasted the Pharisees just before that. And now they come along and go, hey, he's with us. So let's jump in here and see what he says. And they were trying to work him for their benefit against the Pharisees. Now, he says in verse uh, 20, Eight. It says, Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. And Jesus answered and said unto them, You do err. See, Jesus was an independent. Right? I mean, he, he believed, by all accounts, like the Pharisees, as far as what he believed, the doctrines he believed in. But he didn't join with either group. And here he says, You do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. <clears throat> now, he says, For in the resurrection they neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in heaven. But as touching the resurrection of the dead. In other words, you want to talk about the resurrection? Let's talk about it. He says, Have you not read that which is spoken unto you by God, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob? God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, now notice, multitude, right? Not Sadducees, multitude. <clears throat> they were astonished at his doctrine. And they I'm sure, too, they were thinking, man, he just blasted the Pharisees, and now he's blasting the Sadducees. You know, he, he wasn't really part of I mean, he's not like John. Here's John out there by himself, camel's hair girdled, and all that kind of stuff. And here's Jesus in here talking with people, fellowshipping, eating in their homes, and all that kind of stuff. So he's not with John. Who is he with? And he wasn't like the Essenes, because the Essenes were strictly... <clears throat> they were trying to kill all desire. They, actually, you know, if you really study the Essenes, they were almost like the Buddhist, trying to kill all desire, all physical representation. Obviously, they didn't believe the same, but I'm just giving you an example of how they were trying to rid themselves of, you know, the eight, you know, wrong desire, wrong speaking, wrong action, that kind of stuff. <clears throat> then he says, now, well, now watch this. They were astonished at his doctrine. But when the Pharisees had heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, See, they're always playing against each other all the time. They were gathered together. Then one of them, which was a lawyer. Now, when we say lawyer, obviously we're not thinking lawyer like we have today. We're thinking people who were well-versed in the law. They knew the law. They, they had studied it. They knew it. <clears throat> and so it says that one which was a lawyer asked him a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. He said, This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now, if you've been here very long, you've heard these things drilled, right? And the amazing thing is that both of these have nothing to do with duties or even with actions, meaning telling you, like the Pharisees, wash your hands, do the, you know, all these rituals. It had to do with actions and duties of how you relate to people. Okay? Now, <clears throat> he goes on. It says, On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now, notice, while the Pharisees were gathered together, while they're all gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they say unto him, The son of David. And he saith unto them, How then does David in spirit call him Lord, saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. In other words, if David, how can the Christ be the son of David whenever David spoke about him and called him Lord? How could the man's son, King David, the great king, prophet, psalmist, and all that, how could he turn around and call this, his seed Lord when the word Lord, the way he used it here, was reserved strictly for God? And so either, he said, how does he do that? You explain that. And ask the, the Pharisees that. He said, if David didn't call him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him in a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. So in other words, they got together and said, you know, he may have looked pretty stupid. Because here we are. Here's this guy. He's a lawyer. Knows the law. Knows the word of God. Knows all these things. And we were trying to get him, you know, locked into this thing. And... He turned it right around on us, and now we look stupid. So don't anybody ask him a question, because all it's going to do is hurt us in the next election. Right? I mean, that's kind of the mentality, right? We, we don't want that. Okay? We don't want to look stupid. 
because it's not good. Okay? Now, he goes on. <clears throat> he says, you know, I used to tell people that, well, I probably shouldn't have said that with me. <laughs> I always said, you know, we have Republicans and Democrats, and in the Bible they would have been called publicans and Democrats. So, anyway, so, so, <clears throat> and you think I'm an independent. No, you have no clue what I am. Okay? <laughs> now, he says, then, and now we're going to go down to Matthew 23, verse 1. Then, now, just because there's a chapter break there doesn't mean that anything, there's nothing in the scriptures that breaks it, right? It just continues right on. It's just for people's uh, laziness <clears throat> that it makes it easier to find, okay? Then spoke Jesus to, spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples. So all that's going on, and it says then, okay? So right after he did this, now he throws in in verse 46 up there, Nobody answered him a word, so they didn't ask him from then on. But that's just kind of parenthetical because this is still the same situation. The same people are still there. But he turned to his disciples, to the multitude. Now, he's got Sadducees here, Pharisees there. He's got his disciples and the multitude. So he's got a pretty good group there. And he turns to, his, to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, now, now think about this. They're all there. And he turns to him and he refers to him and says, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Right? They sit in Moses' seat. Now, you can imagine, because they're still there. And you can imagine they're talking to him and the people, he's, they can't answer questions. So everybody's thinking, okay, then, well, who is he? What's, you know, what group is he with? And then he says, listen, the scribes and the Pharisees. He didn't say the scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Right? He left them out. And he said, the scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. In other words, they're in authority. Now, you can imagine the Pharisees standing back there thinking, yeah, we've got to get this guy. I don't know how we're going to... What did he say? He just said we're, we have authority. He, okay, well, maybe, maybe we misjudged him. Let's hang on here. Maybe let's see where he's going with this. You know, I'm sure they all straighten their robes and, you know, tighten their phylacteries. And, yes, let's look like we sit. You see what I'm saying? Just that mentality of, of what was going on. <clears throat> he said, all, therefore, whatsoever they bid you observe that observe and do. And I'm sure they're like, yeah, okay, let's listen to it. But do not ye after their works. Now you know they probably feel like, uh, okay, this is part where we need to leave, right? I'm sure they're thinking, uh, so we need to tell him we're still here, we can hear him, right? He's acting like we're not here, but we can still hear him talking about us. You know they didn't like that part when they said, do what they tell you to do, but don't do what they do. I mean, that's pretty obvious. And it says, for they say and do not. For they bind heavy burdens and grievous to be born. Now, you know they can't be liking this, right? I mean, already they can't be liking. And it says, and lay them on men's shoulders. But they themselves will not move them with one of their fingers. Right? Will not move them with one. In other words, I mean, I'm mad they're still, I just can't get over the fact they're still standing there. And listening to all this, you know they can't be happy. It says, but all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments. <clears throat> and they love the uppermost rooms at feast and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings and the mar They're still standing there. They're hearing every bit of this. Now, you can see why sometimes there was a tumult. All right? People get upset over these things. They want to shout him down, tell him to shut up and the greetings in the market, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi. For one is your master, even Christ, and all you are brethren. Now see, he just now differentiated himself from everybody else. And they're right. Now they're probably thinking, oh, okay, no wonder he didn't want to join with us. He's got his own agenda. He's got his own little party he's trying to, to, to grow up, his own little sect uh, that he's trying to pull up here. And he says, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Isn't that right? Now, that where it says, For one is your father which is in heaven. Now, where, where was Jesus standing when he said this? Earth. On earth. But the father is in heaven. Right? Proves the differentiation between the Godhead. Okay? Just so if, if you're, anybody has a question with that. Now, he says, <clears throat> Neither, yeah, in, or verse 9, sorry. And call no man father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. But he that is greatest among you shall be your servant. 
and whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. But woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees. See, they were still standing there because he's talking to them, right? Directly. Now, he had, he had turned and talked to, or I say turned, he had talked to the multitude, talked to his disciples, but now, in the middle of his talking to people, saying, don't be called master, don't be called rabbi, he, he turns to the, to the Pharisees and says, but you Pharisees, woe to you Pharisees. Now, watch what he says. <clears throat> he says, I'm at here. Yeah, woe unto you scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For you neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Twice he said it. <clears throat> for you devour widows' houses. And for a pretense, make long prayer. Therefore you shall receive the greater damnation. Now you notice, that's the first time he pronounced a, a, a judgment on somebody like that. He said, you're going to get the greater damnation, not just because of the longer prayers, but the first part is the major part. He said, you devour widows' houses. Now, whenever you start hurting the innocent and you start hurting people that you should be protecting and when you're in a position of authority and you end up doing this to where you, and I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but where you use, abuse, exploit, manipulate, that kind of stuff, <clears throat> there is judgment that comes with that. And he says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you compass sea and land to make one proselyte. And when he is made, you make him twofold more the child of hell than you yourselves. <laughs> now that is pretty strong. Imagine. Everybody says, Oh, Jesus, please come. Just come. You, you sure? Because if he showed up, you think he's going to be any nicer today? Think about this. Because, I mean, he was blunt. That kind of preaching, if I went to a church and just got up on the platform and said, where's all the ministers? Ministers, stand up. What are they going to do? Yeah, good to be recognized. They're going to stand up and say, now, woe to you. And start, start reading this right here. You know what they're going to say? Who are you to judge? Well, I'm just going by the Scripture. What are you doing? You say, well, yeah, but you don't know their heart. No, out of the abundance of the mouth, the heart speaks. I do. You can know people's hearts. See, everybody always says that. Well, you, you don't know their heart. Yeah, you do. You know their heart or what comes out their mouth. Is there any way around that? Well, what if the what's coming out of their mouth is, now, you can be anointed if you'll send in twenty five ninety five every month. That's what's in their heart. And what are they doing? They are devouring widows' houses. Do you know that 95, 90 to 95% of all contributions that go to televangelists come from, for lack of a better word, widows' houses? Almost every, almost, well, I can't give this, I don't know the, the uh, thing on it, but I was reading through this a while back with uh, George Varna. He was given a list of statistics, and I want to say it was like 50% of offerings come in are offerings that are automatic withdrawal and deposit from Social Security. Now, think about that. Now, anyway, let's go on. <clears throat> All right, you can kind of see where we're going with this tonight, okay? He says, in verse... 16, woe unto you, you blind guides, which say, whosoever shall swear by the temple, it's nothing. But whosoever shall swear by the gold of the temple, he's a debtor. He said, you fools and blind. For whether is greater, the gold or the temple that sanctifies the gold. And you see, whenever they said, oh, it's okay to swear by the temple, that's right, but don't swear by the, the, the gold in the temple. It showed where their treasure was. It showed where their heart was. It showed what they were going after, that the gold in the temple meant more than the temple itself. And I'm telling you today, two, let me give you a twofold um, <laughs> expounding on this. Number one, the gold in the temple, the church building, for lack of a better term at this point, is more important to many preachers than the people in the building and the building itself. Secondly, the gold in the people's pockets, since we are the temple of God, are more important to many ministers than the people that the gold is in their pockets. You see that? Now, let's go on. <clears throat> Can you all tell I've been reading Andrew Carnegie's uh, How to Win Friends and Influence People? <laughs> <laughs> all right, let's move on. He says here, <clears throat> he says, uh, let's see, you fools, which is, yeah. 
And whosoever shall swear by the altar is nothing, but whoever swears by the gift that's upon it, he is guilty. You fools and blind, for whether is greater the gift or the altar that sanctifies the gift. Whoso therefore shall swear by the altar sweareth by it and by all things thereon. And whoso shall swear by the temple swears by it and by him that dwelleth therein. And he that shall swear by heaven sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sits thereon. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought you to have done and not to leave the other undone. He said, you emphasize... You see, go back to what he's talking about. He's talking about the gold in the temple. He's talking about the gift on the altar. And now he's saying here that you pay tithe and you're real picky about the financial aspect. But when it comes to judgment and faith and mercy, you forget all about that stuff. Now, does that sound anything like today? Does it sound anything like if you turn on so-called Christian television, does it sound anything like what you see on there? Of course it does. It's almost identical. They're all, now it's all money. That's why I said on the TV program the other day, I said it's time for preachers to get back to preaching the gospel and quit preaching money all the time. And it's true. The, the Christianity, my daughter and I was talking about this the other day. Years ago, there was a lot of, uh, well, Christianity was different. Even 20 years ago. Totally different. Different music. Even what they sung about, sang about in the music is different than it is today. And what is, what is passing for Christianity today is nothing like it was even 20 years ago. And there has been such a watering down, a dumbing down, a secularization of Christianity that another 20 years, you can go to any AA meeting or you know, anything else, any self-help. You know, put, instead of having a... Uh, there are some churches today where they put on a DVD and the pastor hadn't even been there and they play it. And, you know, a couple of years from now, they'll be putting Dr. Phil on and you won't notice any difference because it's all going towards self-help. There's stuff like that going on just a couple of hundred miles south of, of us here. And it's nothing but a self-help gospel, which is not a gospel, all right? There's nothing self-help about the gospel, right? And because we couldn't help ourselves is why we have the gospel. Amen? All right. Now, he goes on. Let's finish reading this here. <clears throat> he says, You blind guides... Do you realize how many times he says this? Just bam. Now, he said a lot faster than I did. I'm interjecting stuff in between. You ought to just take this some time and just read it out loud at, at a normal reading speed. I'm telling you, it'll, it's amazing, the difference. It says, You blind guys which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. It's like those three always went together. It's almost like three groups of people. Scribes, Pharisees, and hypocrites, even though the hypocrite was describing the first two. But he always said them together. For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. Isn't it? You hear that? Extortion and excess. Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter. Now, why is he saying it that way? Because the big thing that they had was what they called baptisms and washings and ordinances where they were constantly, the, the rituals of the Bible that were okay do you realize what they did was they, they made the oral teachings of the church of that day more binding than the written word of God right and then later on I'm going to mention this a little bit later on too the Roman Catholic Church did the same thing which is what caused the Reformation because Martin Luther noticed that they were selling indulgences and if people paid enough money, their family could get out of purgatory. And so they were doing exactly the same thing. And, and even today, now let's just carry it on. I want to harp on the Catholic Church. Let's go to the, today. The, the oral traditions in the charismatic, spirit-filled community slash church today are usually more binding than the written Word of God. You look around and look at all the things that's taught in the church. And for the most part... It's not what the Bible says that counts, but our interpretation of it, which usually has nothing to do with what it actually said. Because every time Jesus said, you've heard it said, he didn't ever say, you've heard it written, or you've seen it written. Every time he said it's written, he enforced it. Every time he said, you've heard it said, in other words, the oral teachings that you've been taught, he always turned them around. 
He always said just the opposite. Why? Because they had a backwards church back then too. And now we got a backwards church today. It's exactly the same thing. Now, why? Because the same group is still in charge. Pharisees who are more concerned with the finances and the money and making sure that, it, that they are in a position of authority than they are of setting people free, which is why Jesus came. All right? Let's look at this. He says in verse 27, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchres, graves, tombs, which indeed appear beautiful outward, but are within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness. Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within you are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers of the righteous. Stop right there. Now, you notice that's the same thing today? Notice what he says. You build the tombs of the prophets and garnish the sepulchers. In other words, you clean them up, you take care of them, you know where this prophet was buried and that prophet was buried, and oh yeah, and you look real good because you're laying a wreath on it and saying, we remember the day he died and you do all these. They were saying... You, you you build these tombs and you make big monuments of to show people because you want people, Mary said at the very beginning, you do this to be seen of men. So everything you're doing, you're doing it to associate you with them so that they will see how good you're doing and how you respect the past and how you respect the, the, the prophets in the old days. And yet you got people today on television that will quote Smith Wigglesworth, that will quote John Lake, that will quote... Lester Summerall that will quote all these people and if any one of those people were alive today and heard them quote them they'd slap them they wouldn't put up with them for one minute why? because they're pulling out little words that they said and yet they're not living the lives that would give them the right to quote these people let alone try to make it sound like their doctrine fits into the doctrines being preached today and we, we have got to realize I'm telling you I'm pushing for a point tonight and, and that's why I'm, I said I'm, I, I'm saying this for the camera, I'm saying it for the CD, because this needs to go out. It needs to get everywhere you can possibly take. Take copies, give it away, make copies, whatever. I don't care who burns copies. I don't care. Just don't start selling them, because then you'll be just like this person. You know, the people he's talking about here. Now, <laughs> full of all extortion and uncleanness. So. But now, he says, You built, you garnished the sepulchres of the righteous, and say, If we had been in the days of our fathers... If we had lived back then, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. He said, if we had lived back... See, I'm going to quote something else here in just a minute about Ezekiel. And Ezekiel, according to all to, to Jewish tradition, he was killed during the Babylonian captivity. And while he was in the captivity, he said all the things that everybody knows... Well, a lot of people aren't, don't know what he said, but he blasted. He was... Uh, <laughs> He reproved and rebuked and corrected and all that. And they killed him because of the things he said. Matter of fact, they said that he was hooked around the feet and dragged until his brains were bashed out. And that's, uh, even Josephus said this is a fact. And even an Arabic um, historian said the same thing, said that he was buried and that he was killed for what he was preaching. So here they're saying, you build these men's tombs and you talk about them and you say, oh yeah, our fathers killed these people, but if we'd lived back then, we wouldn't have done that. We, we were with them. We see their greatness, and we understand, and we agree with them. No, it's always easy to say that when the person's dead. But had Ezekiel been alive during this time, they would, they would have killed him too because he would have been railing against the things that Jesus was railing against, right? Because he was a prophet, and Jesus was a prophet there. Prophets always come and rail against the wrong. So, he says, Wherefore, you be witnesses unto yourselves that you are the children of them which kill the prophets. Then fill ye up the measure of your fathers. In other words, measure up to them. That's what you're doing. You're going you're to kill them. You're going to kill the prophets. You're going to kill me just like, you, just like your fathers killed the prophets then. He said, you serpents, you generation of vipers, how can you escape the damnation of hell? Did you hear what he's saying? That, that wasn't even a statement. It was a question. He said, he called them to their faces serpents, generation of vipers. And he says, how can you escape the, the damnation of hell? How, can it, how are you going to escape it? And you all know that they were thinking, I mean, they even said many times about Jesus himself. They said, now we know us and we know 
where this person was born and that person. But we don't know about him. We don't know if he's a sinner, if he's what. We don't know anything about him. And remember the man that he opened his eyes, healed him, and he said, well, it's funny that you don't know what he is because he made me see. And they, they said, well, we know who we are. And Jesus even told him one time, you know, you, you, you talk about you being the children of Abraham. Well, we know who our father is. And Jesus said, no, you don't. And he said, because your father is the devil. He said it clearly. Isn't that right? Yes. He says in verse 34, Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall you scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Now, this is what Jesus said about the accepted, recognized religious leaders of his day. Isn't that right? Now, do you really think he would have been accepted in the synagogues and in the play? I mean, no wonder he preached in the open air. Same reason John Wesley did. You shut down churches to people, they start preaching in the open air. And that's exactly what was going on with them. Now, he's, now, now think about this. Now, here's the question. What do you think he would say to the religious leaders today? I mean, how close are the religious leaders today to the descriptions of what I just read? Because if you look at just, just Christianity in general, it is identical. Identical in what's going on in the church. And I'm telling you this, and this is... Here's, here's the deal. Years ago, I was studying, and I started seeing things in the Scriptures. Just plain truth. Simple, right there, black and white and red, Right? Just reading it. And I remember, because I'd been taught by some good people. I'd sat under some good teaching. And then it hit me. I was looking at this and I said, you know, because there were some pretty harsh things, pretty hard, you know, just totally contradictory to what, was, what I was being taught. And I said, no, wait a minute. If the people I'm listening to, if they are truly spiritual leaders, why don't they see this? I mean, come on, I'm just a guy, right? I mean, I'm just, anybody can read. And if you just read it, you can't help but see it. And I thought, if these are the religious leaders, they either see it or they don't. If they don't see it, then they don't deserve to be my religious leader. And if they do see it and aren't preaching against it, then they don't deserve to be my spiritual leader. Isn't that right? So I started looking at this, and that's when I started analyzing who I was following, who I was listening to. And honestly... It caused a separation. It caused me to have to go a different way, and I didn't go the way I was going before, and I didn't... It's not that those people, are, they're all going to hell. That's between them and God. I don't know. All I know is that I knew that I could not continue to go that way. Years back, I wrote a letter and uh, sent it to uh, CSNI, Christ for Nations, and asked them to publish it in their magazine, and they published it for me. And this was after I'd been preaching I know, a few years. It wasn't real long, but a few years... And I just wrote an article and I said, this is an open apology. Because I didn't know who else would print it. You know, to other magazines, they wouldn't print it. But I said, this is an open apology. I'm sorry for having preached a easy grace, easy, get, you know, just what I had preached at that point. Basically, live any way you want, do anything you want, it doesn't matter. And, and it wasn't like I was just telling people that. But I'm saying I just wasn't telling them both sides of the coin. I was only telling one part of it. I was talking about the blessings of God and never about the responsibilities. The blessings of God and never about the duties. And the blessings of God and never about the possible judgments and what what it was necessary to live right. Now, the amazing thing, because believe me, when I'm doing this message and it was all coming together, I mean, the first thing I do is I start analyzing myself. I mean, that, that should be the first thing a preacher does when he starts to give a message, make sure he's not doing the things he's fixing to be preaching against. And as I'm looking at this, and, and yeah, there was some area in my life where I, I, I look at that and I say, okay, I've got to repent on that. That's, turn that around. You know, just don't go that way anymore. And repentance doesn't have to be long drawn out. It can be a decision. Bam, and it's done. But as I was looking at this, I realized Jesus taught the word verbatim. Isn't it right? He, was, he would have been a good Pharisee. As a matter of fact, I even have that statement in here somewhere that most Christians today would make good Pharisees. But the problem is Pharisees don't make good Christians. You get that? Christians would make good Pharisees. 
sticklers for the law, literal interpretation, believe in the resurrection, believe in spirit. But the problem is most Pharisees are not Christians. You understand? They're not born again. They're not of the Spirit of God. They don't know what spirit they're of, but they're not of the Spirit of God. And so when I was looking at that, I started analyzing some of these things and just saying, okay, what has to be done? What is my part? What do I need to do? Right? And he says, now, there were good and bad Pharisees. Right? Good and bad. So let's look at this. Matthew chapter 15, verse 1. Matthew 15, verse 1. It says, Then came to Jesus scribes and Pharisees, which were of Jerusalem, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? Now, hear what that? Scribes and Pharisees come up and says, Jesus, listen, why... And now, I'm sure they weren't friendly about it. They said, Why does your disciples break our laws and the, and the laws of the elders? Remember, they've only been around 150 years. And so any laws that the elders had had only been there for about 150 years. And so why, why do they transgress the laws of the elders? Jesus turns around because it says, For they wash not their hands when they eat bread. But he answered and said to them, Why do you transgress the commandment of God by your tradition? You see that? He didn't just go, Well, listen, guys, it, washing the hands isn't all that important. He, he didn't say that. He turned it right back on and says, Why do you transgress? He said, You're asking me why I transgress man's traditions? I'll ask you a question. Why do you transgress the commandments of God? Turn it right back on him. He says, For God commanded, see, Jesus still preaching, For God commanded, saying, Honor your father and your mother, and he that curses father and mother, let him die the death. But you say, Whosoever shall say to his father or his mother, It's a gift, by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free. Jesus said, Clear cut. That's what God said, but you transgress that. You don't do what God said. Now, that honestly, that sounds almost like a Pharisee. Written stickler for the word. Isn't that right? But the difference was when Jesus was a stickler for the word, he did it out of love for God and fellow man. When Pharisees were sticklers for the literal interpretation of the word, it always had to do with position, being seen, and doing things for, posi- for, for position is the best way to say it. So, he says, now notice this, and honor not his father or his mother, he shall be free, verse 6, thus have you made the commandment of God of none effect by your tradition. In other words, you just overruled God. You just said what God said doesn't matter and what you said does. You hypocrites. Now, he's talking to them face to face. You hypocrites. Well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, This people draws nigh unto me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in, now notice, but in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. If you, now you need to get this. We got to get, somehow this has to hit us. You know, I think sometimes we just hear a message, and it's only lasts during the time of the message. But you need Honestly, you need to take this message tonight, think about it, dwell on it, look at it. This needs to cause a separation in the church world. He said, now notice this. Jesus said this. Is it true or not? Jesus said it's true, right? There's no question. There's no debating. Jesus said, this people, well, let me go down to verse 9, but in vain do they worship me. You hear that? There are people that worship God in vain. Isn't that right? Why? Because they teach for doctrines. They teach as the Word of God the commandments of men, the traditions of men. Isn't that right? So if you teach man's traditions and it overrides or overrules the written Word of God, your worship is in vain. Is there any way around that? If y'all show me a way out. I'll, I'll back right out of this and we'll, you know, edit the tape or just trash this one and go on with a real good, feel good message. But I can't find it. He said, there are people, and, and then he tells what people they are, if you teach man's teachings, their doctrines, if you teach what man commands you to do, and you teach that as the Word of God, and you teach it like it's the Word of God, like it's a commandment from God, then your worship is in vain. Now, I don't know about you, but 
I guarantee I could turn on Christian television right now and point the finger at people that are doing this very thing. All across the board, 24 hours a day almost. Now, obviously, people say, oh yeah, but you shouldn't judge. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible does not say don't judge. What it says is, don't judge lest you're also going to be judged with the same standard. Well, what does that mean? That's why he said, examine yourselves, make sure you're in the faith. In other words, everybody might have a piece here, a piece there that they may be missing a little bit. But we're not talking about people that are missing it. We're talking about people who are bold, faced, deceiving. People who know better. See, the Pharisees knew better. They weren't doing this in ignorance. They were blind because they chose to be blind. You know what Jesus told them? You say you see, and because of that, your sin remains. Right? But they chose to be blind. Now watch what he says. Verse 10, And he called the multitude and said unto them, Hear and understand. Now he's talking to the Pharisees, and he turns around. I say turn around. I you know, don't, don't know if he turned around or turned to the side. I don't know. But he, whatever it was, he called the multitude together. And he said to them, Listen. Listen to me. Get this. Understand it. Not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man. Why did he say that? Because they were talking about food that was dedicated and certain things and prayed over and washed hands. And if you touched it with dirty hands, it was defiled. He said, that's not what defiles a man. And the amazing thing is, he said this in the hearing of the Pharisees. Isn't that right? Right in their hearing. <clears throat> he says, it's not that which goes into the mouth defiles a man, but that which comes out of the mouth. Why? Because that's where the doctrines come from that the doctrines of men that you're teaching as the commandment of God that makes you worship in vain. That's what defiles you. It's not what goes in. It's what comes out. <clears throat> Notice, and he is talking specifically still about wrong doctrine. See, it, I've always heard this used in a way talking about positive confession, not saying negative things, not saying wrong things, that kind of stuff. He is not talking about saying wrong things. He's not talking about positive confession. He's talking about wrong doctrine. He, was ju he just said that just before. See, you can pull a scripture out of context, but when you put it in the context, you've got to find out what was going on. Now, <clears throat> then came his disciples and said to him, now, I love this. I, I, I just hear Peter saying this. I don't know why. But it came to him and it says, Knowest thou that the Pharisees were offended after they heard this saying? And I can see Jesus going, <laughs> Duh, I meant for them to be. Isn't that right? I mean, it's pretty obvious. And he said, But he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father has not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. Then answered Peter and said unto him, See, he answered, so I figured it was Peter that said it the first time because now they got a conversation going. Then answered Peter and said unto him, Declare unto us this parable. I can see Jesus going, hello, it wasn't a parable. I mean, not. I mean, it is, but come on. It's pretty obvious. Are you that dense? But you've got to know, these, his disciples did not want to break, really, from the group. They wanted to be leaders of it. And they, they thought they were going to come in and overthrow and be the, you know, the new Sanhedrin. They didn't think, they weren't trying to cause division until they realized what was going on. Then they're kind of like, okay, well, we're not them. <clears throat> but he said, and Jesus said, are you also yet without understanding? Do you, or do not ye yet understand that whatsoever enters in at the mouth goes into the belly and is cast out into the drop? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the heart, and they defile the man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashing hands defiles not a man. Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. Now, Go to John chapter 3. <clears throat> now, that was, an example, that was some examples of bad Pharisees. Okay, there were good and bad ones. That was some bad ones. Come and argue with him. John chapter 3, verse 1. <clears throat> there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. Okay, so Nicodemus was a Pharisee. The same came to Jesus by night. Okay, shows you another characteristic of Pharisees. And said unto him, Rabbi, we. There's not a we there. There's one, right? So if Nick, now it pointed out that Nicodemus was a Pharisee, so when he says we, he's referring to the Pharisees. 
He says, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Do you notice this? Is, now, think about this. He's got all these fights going on with the Pharisees. They're arguing with him, saying all kinds of stuff about him, saying that he's not of God, that he's not born of God, that, he, uh, that he's a sinner, that he's all these things, right? That he cast out devils by Beelzebub. All this stuff. And here, Nicodemus comes and says, at night, when nobody else is around, and says, listen, we know. We, the, the Pharisees, we know that you're a teacher sent from God because no man can do the things you do except God be with you. Now, what is that? What did he just do? He just convicted, not, not conviction like by the Holy Spirit, like convicted in the court of law. He just convicted every Pharisee that was a part of the Pharisees. At this time, there were only about 6,000 Pharisees in the entire Israel. And there was only about 4,000 Sadducees according to Josephus, who was a pretty good historian with numbers. And so it is amazing to me that here you've got Nicodemus coming along and saying, we, the Pharisees, we know you're of God. And yet, publicly, they blasted him. That was why he called them hypocrites. They knew, and he said, because you say you see, that's why you stick out your sin. Because you choose to be blind, because you're more interested in position and other things we'll get into here in a minute. But he says, Jesus answered and said unto him. <clears throat> First off, you notice what he said, though? We know that you're a man sent from God. But then, he says, Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again. Now, you know, we quote this all the time. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Now, the thing to remember this, this statement, all the way down to John 3, 16, he was still, they were still discussing with Nicodemus, who was a Pharisee. He was telling a Pharisee, you must be born again. Isn't that right? Meaning that they were not born again. And I'm telling you what, this is the message many preachers need to hear today. You must be born again. Why? Because whatever happened, I don't know if you ever were born again, but I'm telling you right now, many of them now, have decided to chase mammon instead of going after God. Simple as that. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. First off, he said you can't see it. Now he said you can't enter into it. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I say it, said unto thee, you must be born again. So obviously... He was marveling. He said, can, how can this happen? How can it be? He says, look, the wind blows where it will. And you hear the sound. But you can't tell where it comes or where it goes. So is every one of the Spirit. Why? Because you can't get it, Nicodemus. You're not born again. You've got to be born again of the Spirit so that you can understand this stuff. Then he says, notice this. <clears throat> Nicodemus answered and said, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, are you a master of Israel, a teacher of Israel? And you don't even know these things? And you know, it's like he wants to ask him, what are you teaching? You don't even know what's going on here. You, you don't even know the basics of the kingdom of God, and yet you're a ruler in Israel, and you're guiding these people? What, what was he saying? You don't get it? He, what, do you, what category do you think he was putting Nicodemus in? And now, Nicodemus was showing a good heart to some degree, right? We don't know, really know that much about him at that point. But he was putting Nicodemus in the same group. You're a blind guide. He said, you don't get this? And you're a leader in Israel? You're blind. You don't even get it. And you're leading other people, and you're both going to fall in the ditch. Do you see how it all goes together? He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and we, you receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believes on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, 
because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. And everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that does truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, for they are wrought in God. Now, number one, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. He was a ruler of the people. The Pharisees, <clears throat> along with the Sadducees, were the equivalent of the fivefold ministry today. Essentially, that's what they were. Now, we have the scribes and the lawyers and that kind of thing, but <clears throat> they were the ones responsible for all religious education in Israel. Okay? Now, they had priests at the synagogues, but the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and these people were responsible for making sure that the, the priests knew what to teach. They were the ones in charge of Israel's religious education. They had doctrines that they had taught and were accepted by all the people of Israel. People didn't even think about this. The average secular Jew at that time, Israeli, we would call them today. Secular. Remember I talked about the difference between a theocratic and democratic? <clears throat> all Jews at that time were Jewish, meaning they knew the temple and all that, but what they... They, it didn't mean they were all religious. There were some that were not. They were Jewish because they were Israeli, you understand? But yet they were still secular and they didn't follow the, all the, the principles. Now, <clears throat> it's almost like in Christianity today. You have the nominal Christian, doesn't go to church, you know, just stays home and does whatever. But if you ask them, yeah, I'm a Christian. Well, when, well, I got saved when I was 10 or, you know, whatever it was. And here it was and just kind of live a normal life. I'm a decent person, that kind of stuff. But <clears throat> the secular Jew would never even think to question the Pharisees. It's just accepted. These guys know the law. They know the Bible. They tell us what to believe. We believe it. And as long as we believe it and do what we're told, we're okay with God. That's what counts. Does that sound like today? It's exactly the same thing. Now watch. <clears throat> the thinking Jew, the religious Jew at the time, would consider each position, Pharisee, Sadducee. In other words, a person who wanted a relationship with God, they would start thinking about spiritual things, and then they would find the group that they believed the most like and hook up with them. Sounds like Christians, they go to church regularly and are in the group, right? Typical. Okay. Now, many, well, I already said this, many professing Christians today would make good Pharisees, but Pharisees would not make good Christians because they're not born again. In John chapter 7, starting in verse 43, it says, So there was a division among the people because of him. Talking about Jesus. Now you hear that? Isn't that funny? Jesus caused a division. <clears throat> well, he still does whenever his word is preached accurately. And some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said unto them, Why have you not brought him? In other words, grab him, bring him in. And the officers answered, Never a man spoke like this man. And then answered them the Pharisees. And they said, Listen, you went to hear him? You saw him? Yeah, but, but I'm telling you, man, nobody talks like him. Really? Are you deceived too? Do you become now one of these Christians? Is that what you're doing? What's the matter with you? It says, Have any other... Now see, here's what they're saying. Now notice this. These were officers that went to arrest him. Right? The temple police, basically. They went out there, they were going to arrest him. And they said, are you deceived too? And then they threw out this question. Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed on him? In other words, are you stupid? Look at us. We're not following him. So why would you follow him? Are you following him now? Come on, all the religious leaders, all the people that, you know, that had the best prime time on television, no, none of them was following him. You see that? And it's amazing. It's like, look, if we're not doing it, obviously it can't be of God. Well, isn't that kind of what stops certain revivals? When they start trying to grab a hold of it and say, the reason we're being blessed is because of the name over our door. No, it ain't. It's because of what was going on in the hearts of the people there. Right? It's not because of a name. He says in John chapter 3, remember? Now, now this was funny. He said, have anybody believed him? Have, anybody received, you know, have any of the Pharisees believed on him? Well, uh, Nicodemus said, we know. Nicodemus was believing on him as much as he knew at that time, right? 
So even in that, there was a group. Now, Nicodemus snuck out there, so maybe they didn't know about it. But the Pharisees didn't know he was of God. But they still wanted him arrested, right? Okay. But this people, verse 49, who knows not the law are cursed. Nicodemus said unto them, he's there, he speaks up. He that came to Jesus by night being one of them, does our law judge any man before it hears it? In other words, why are y'all going to go arrest him? Let's hear what he's got to say. And know what he does? And they answered and said unto him, Are you also of Galilee? Now, <laughs> search and look, for out of Galilee arises no prophet. Well, they should have looked a little bit further than Galilee. That isn't where he came from. You see what I'm saying? They should have looked a, They obviously didn't do their research, or they'd have found out where he actually came from. And every they'd be like somebody say, Well, Curry Blake, he's from Dallas, Texas. Well, that may be where I've lived the last 30 years. It's not where I came from, right? And every man went unto his own house. In other words, okay, we can't come to a conclusion. Let's split up and go. Ting. Verse 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bare record, and his record is true, and he knows that what he says is true, that you might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. And again, another scripture says, they shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, <clears throat> Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave. He came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and he brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds. So I was trying to show you that there were some good Pharisees in the group, right? There were some good ones. Now, Matthew 5.20, here's the thing. <clears throat> Jesus said, For I say unto you, that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, that means they believe the right things. They <clears throat> believe pretty much like everybody does today, like spirit-filled, charismatic Christians for the most part. So they believe the right things, but at the same time, many, they were... See, they... Again, I know I keep repeating myself. They believe the right things. But they taught, as the commandments of God, the traditions of men. See, they, they believe in the basics. It's like most Christians today. You turn on Christian television, you ask any of those guys on television, and I know I feel like I'm picking on them. Well, I am, because they're the ones that are visible, right? But it goes on everywhere else, too, because whatever's on television trickles down into all the churches. And you ask them, do you believe, you know, in the resurrection? Yeah. you believe in literal interpretation of the word? Yeah. Do you believe in spirits, demons? Yeah. But that ain't what they're teaching about. What they're teaching about, for the most part now, is money. Almost totally and completely. And if it ain't money, it's got something to do with money. Somehow. You know, even if it's, well, we got to get, you know, power in the, in the political system. So we need money to put together a lobby thing or something. It's, it's going to go back to money somewhere. <clears throat> Romans chapter 10, verse 3. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Anytime you go about to set your own righteousness, you are not submitted to the righteousness of God. There is no... It, it's an either or. You can't have both. You can't have faith and rely upon and trust in the blood of Jesus and the grace of God and the righteousness of God to come upon you because of that grace and at the same time believe that anything you do is going to put you in greater favor with God. You cannot believe the same thing at the same time. One overrules the other. It's either by grace or it is by works. Now, understand, I'm not saying that you can live any way you want. I'm saying that if you truly receive the grace of God, you will live a life that shows it, which we call holiness. All right? Now, and that's not the type of clothes you wear. It's not, you understand, it's not those things, even though it will show through those things too. Right? It goes all together. Like we said, the total package, right? The whole thing, okay? Now, the Pharisee heart tries to establish their own righteousness with God through obedience and works. Now, get that, through obedience and works. And by doing so, they cut themselves off from the righteousness established by God. You do, even you being obedient, 
does not put you in right standing with God. You understand that? You're obedient because you're in right standing. Your obedience doesn't put you in right standing, right? The blood of Jesus and you accepting Him puts you in right standing with God. Well, I'm hammering this for a reason. Romans 5, 17, For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. The Pharisee heart cannot see righteousness as a free gift. They can only see it as a reward for works and perfect obedience. They can only understand working for it. That's why it's so hard for Americans to understand grace. Because, well, I'm a self-made man. I, I got where I was by hard work, and I deserve it, and I work for it, and I got myself, you see what I'm saying? That's the mentality. Honest day's work, honest day's pay, that kind of stuff. And when you have that mentality, if you're not careful, it'll take you out of the entire understanding of the grace of God. He says, I, he says, I wrote this, so I say actually. They can only understand working for it. They don't want to feel indebted to anyone, not even God. Now, real quick, and we're just about finished here. Ezekiel. This is out of Matthew Henry's commentary. I don't normally quote from them, but this stuff is pretty good, so I'll, I'll tell you real quick. Concerning the writer of Ezekiel, it was, of course, Ezekiel. His name signifies the strength of God, or one girt or strengthened of God. That's what Ezekiel means. He girded up the loins of his mind to the service, and God put strength into him. Now, that's Matthew Henry's commentary. Whom God calls to any service, he will in himself enable for it. If he give commission, he will give power to execute it. Ezekiel's name was answered when God said, and no doubt did as he said, I have made thy face strong against their faces. If we may give credit to the tradition of the Jews, he was put to death by the captives, his own people in Babylon, for his faithfulness and boldness in reproving them. It is stated that they dragged him upon the stones until his brains were dashed out. An Arabic historian says he was put to death and was buried in the sepulcher of Shem, the son of Noah. That's common. Now, our March newsletter. I'm going to read you just part of it. One problem in the church is that most people only read material that is written today. Few people read the works of those of the past that actually live Christianity. Most authors today preach from theory and have lived a life that has very little depth of purpose or principle. Most people only read self-help and feel-good material, motivational material. I would urge you to read the biographies of William Booth, John Wesley, George Mueller, and Charles Finney. These men of God actually lived out their understanding of the Bible. They lived believing that not only could they change the world, but also that they must. That to live any other way than all out for God was to waste a life regardless of what else they achieved. This was before the day of the American dream slash gospel. <clears throat> this was back when people really believed that total consecration to God meant total consecration to God's purposes. I believe that the book of Ephesians proves that we, the church, will grow up into Him, Christ, in all things in Ephesians 4.15. I also believe that means that there will be a correction in the church. I think that's coming very soon. And that that correction, now I don't say it here. Actually, I'll read the rest of it. <clears throat> it. There will be a correction in the church that will cause Christians to see the truth and return to their first love. I believe that in the near future we will start to see more and more Christians speak out against the excess and start supporting missionaries and orphans with their money rather than supporting luxurious lifestyles. Right? I believe that in the near future we're going to see a mass exodus from these from mega churches, not that all of them are bad or evil and all, but I'm saying from the churches that preach a self help gospel and are not preaching the true gospel, I believe God I believe God by his spirit is calling people back to truth and I believe that correction's coming I believe it's honestly coming pretty soon. Uh, and what, what's going now? Here's the thing: I believe we're going to see a mass exodus out of the organized churches and into more home groups and things like that. And the first thing that's going to come out on Christian television and Christian magazines is there's a great falling away. And it's not going to be a falling away; it's going to be a falling to. Amen. That's right. All right. And whatever, and that's going to shake a lot of people up. And it's going to scare a lot of people. And people are going to have to be founded in Jesus and secure in Him, so that no matter what the majority and the big names say, 
people will stand by their own conviction that they're following God. All right? Now, <clears throat> I say here, yep, if your knowledge of the Word of God exceeds your obedience to the Word of God, you're backslidden regardless of how spiritually excited you are. I've been speaking about a revolution. I'm, gonna, I'm just reading some of this stuff straight out to you. A revolution is never quiet, it's never neat, and it's never orderly. All right? If you want neat, quiet, and orderly, you are not going to find it in a revolution. I don't care what kind it was. The American Revolution was not neat, quiet, and orderly. All right? the, what they call the Reformation was not neat, quiet, and orderly. And many people paid with it, just like the American Revolution, with their lives. They paid for what they believed with their lives. Now, a revolution, the American Revolution cost people their lives, their property, their careers, etc. But they fought for future generations. Even though they knew they may not live to see the next day, they fought anyway to provide a future for the next generation. Now, that's the same type of mentality we have to have. What makes you think that you're going to be a part of God's next move? Now, see, this is the height of arrogance. This is typical Christianity. Oh, we're on the cutting edge. We are going to be in the, we're going to be God's next move. We're going to be, really? You think so? How bad can you stand persecution? How bad can you stand people talking about you? How, how, how much of that can you take before you quieten down and go back and join them? That's what's going to determine if you're God's next move. Because everybody that's ever part of God's move always got blasted. Some of them got killed. The prophets got killed. The apostles got killed. We have no proof that any apostle lived to an old age or died of old age. No proof. Matter of fact, most histories record they were all martyred for their faith. Isn't that right? What makes you think you're any different? Now, the, the beauty of it is, so far in America, they can't kill you, right? They will sure talk about you, and they will kill your reputation. They will kill everything. They may, it may cost you jobs. You need me to stop? You want to switch over for a minute? Okay, well, I, I'll, just let me know. This is beyond preaching. This is different, all right? I'm, I'm not trying to get a neat message out here. We're trying to get the heart of God across this thing of what's coming. I'm telling you, this. you need to get a... This, like I said, this is... When those messages... <clears throat> it's not fun, but it's got to be done. So, he says, I say here, I'm writing, what makes you think you're going to be a part of God's next move <clears throat> That you're and that you're going to be part, and you think you're also going to be part of a crowd? You know, it's amazing. If we had the parking lot full, if we had people sitting out front with loudspeakers, more people would be coming in here because they're going to go, what's going on there? And, right? and then they would come here, but it's just funny, a lot of people come here and they see 10 people. They see 15 people, 20, 30, whatever we have at different times, right? And they look and go, well, I don't know. It's just too small. And then they'll leave. Well, no, it's not pretty enough, not fancy enough. And then they go to the big, pretty fancy churches where there's thousands of people. And they go, this is so big, I just feel like a number. Well, what, what do you want? Well, but you know, they got everything. They got, they got the, the children's programs and they got this thing going on and they got clean restrooms and nice, and they got all this nice and comfortable and it's pretty. And you look at that, and, and yeah, you know what? And you're paying for it. Is that where you want your money to go? Be pretty in your home, right? Be comfortable in your home. You didn't come here to be comfortable. My job is to afflict the comforted, right? And to comfort the afflicted. That's my job. As a preacher, that's my job. So it's not about what this place looks like or anything. Hopefully, we won't be here long enough to fix it up or do anything else. Hopefully, we'll move on. And I'm not talking about bigger and better and nicer. I'm not talking about that either. I'm talking about scattered into groups. I'm talking about just, we just gather like this so we can videotape and record and get the messages out there. Who cares what the walls look like? If you're in China, you're not going to worry about walls. In, in Nicaragua, they worry about walls, Fabian. Yeah, they're doing good if they got walls. Cow, cow, cow dung walls. That's what they had in Africa, too. And you're thinking, yeah, the whole time you're there, it's like they got this little thing and you're in there and you're like, what is that smell? <laughs> and you can't figure it out, you know, and you're leaning against the wall and you go, oh, that's cow dung. Really? <laughs> okay. You know? And you come back and you smell like it for two weeks. You know? They don't care what it looks like. And yet we get all... And then we talk about it. And we blast it. And we talk about it. And we, we say just the opposite. And yet that's what we want. Why? Cause, and, and then we say, well, well, we want crowds. You know why you want crowds? Because you don't like crowds. People don't like crowds because they don't like to feel like a number. They want to they know people, right? And you know why you want a crowd? Because we... I even have it here. Somewhere. <clears throat> Yeah, well, I'll get there in a second. In crowds, you feel if there's a crowd, you must be right. Because surely if we're right, the more right we are, the bigger crowds we'll have. That's never been the Bible. The, the closer you get to truth, the more narrow the gate gets. 
And the more narrow the gate, the more people are not there, right? right. And the closer Jesus got to, to the crucifixion, the fewer people he had. So you need to realize that. Next, and I'm going to quote, and I know Benjamin Franklin wasn't the best moral example, but I'm going to quote him real quick because he made a good statement. His thing was this, we must all hang together or we shall surely all hang separately. And that's the motto of every revolution. And that's what causes the close knit. That's the same feeling, the same mentality that the early Christians had. We've got to, we've got to come together and decide, is this truth or is it not? If it's truth, we've got to live by it. If it's not, then let's just go back and be whatever we were before. Amen? Amen. That's what we got to do. Now, do we need to change over? No. Go ahead and change over real quick. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read an article here in a minute, but I'll wait until you change it. So go ahead. You are not missing anything on the tape. Go ahead. All right. <clears throat> Part two. Now, I'm going to read an article. This is this month's Charisma Magazine. I don't know if, you know, if you've got it or not. If not, you should get it, right? And you should get it, and you should do two things. You should get it. Number two, read it. But actually, number two is, I'm going to read an article by a man named David Ravenhill, right? And you should get the article and write to them, get the address, and write to David, you know, the editor or whatever, but reference David Ravenhill's article, and you should comment about it, and, and if you agree with it, then you should really try to make sure, because he's going to catch flack, all right? I mean, he's going to catch it over this article, and we need Charisma to know that we are behind him, right? And that they need to keep more of this coming, okay? So, I'll read you the article. <clears throat> Let me find it here. Yes. <clears throat> it's Prophetic Edge is the, article, is the um, column name. <clears throat> it's called... It's by David Ravenhill, and it's called You Can't Bribe God. He says, Nothing makes my blood boil more than the purposeful misinterpretation of or adding to God's word for man's own selfish gain. During the time of Martin Luther, the Roman Catholic Church was notorious for its widespread practice of selling indulgences. We talked about this earlier. The people were taught to believe that by giving to the church, they could obtain God's favor. You know, I might have should have done the offering before I start reading all this. Anyway, all right. <clears throat> it says, thereby enabling their dead relatives to be released from purgatory. Now, that's not the ski resort we're talking about here. Today, we laugh at such a concept and wonder to ourselves how the people could fall for such false teaching. But during this time, the common people were denied access to the Word of God. So they believed anything they were told, especially by the priests. Despite the fact that we now have the Word of God readily available to us, many still believe what the priests tell us today. Take, for example, the latest twist on the seed faith teaching. <clears throat> it is based around Moses' instruction to Israel about their three annual feasts. The key phrase ministers emphasize is, You shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. The teaching goes like this. In order to gain God's favor, you have to bring Him an offering. And the larger the offering, the greater will be His favor towards you. That's being taught right now. I heard this myself on television not long ago. I could give you the names. might just do that. <laughs> he says, One prominent shyster... <laughs> Don't hold back. David, tell us how you really feel. <laughs> All right. He is. I'm telling you, it's good stuff. One prominent shyster teaches that on the Day of Atonement, each year, God decides how He is going to treat us during the year. So, what influences His decision is whether or not we have given Him a sufficient offering. That's what's taught. <clears throat> no offering, no favors. The favors include angelic protection, the defeat of one's enemies, financial prosperity... <clears throat> healing, and so on. According to this teaching, to appear before the Lord empty-handed is to sign your own death warrant. If you do, you will die. That's what it's taught. Hence, the popularity of the message. Well, of course, it feeds the flesh. <clears throat> what the teachers of this false doctrine don't tell you is the full context of the verse they're quoting. You hear that? This is a doctrine that's been brought out because of pulling Scripture out of context 
and not reading the rest of the scripture. Isn't that what I tell you all the time? Look at the context. Read the whole scripture. Don't stop halfway through. Moses actually tells the people, The Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that you shall surely rejoice. Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, which is at the feast, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man, now I'm reading, this is from the Scriptures, every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God, which he has given you. God's blessing was not conditional upon their giving to him, but upon his having already given to them which is exactly the opposite of what's being taught. <clears throat> they were not blessed because they, were get, because they gave. They gave because they were blessed. It is also... Now, I love this. This is... See it. Because he... This is David Ravenhill. He says, It is also important to understand that these requirements are no longer valid under the New Covenant. Amen. Right? Bringing in the New Covenant and showing... Because that's another thing that the TV teachers forget. Every spiritual first grader knows that we cannot merit God's favor. God is not for sale to the highest bidder, nor can we earn His favor by our own efforts or works. When Paul addressed the Stoic philosophers on Mars Hill and sought to describe the difference between the true God and their many idols, he told them this about God. He gives to all life, breath, and all things. He gives to all, not all buy from Him. <clears throat> what sets God apart from all other gods is that He is a giver. What utter blasphemy then to suggest that God can be bribed to favor us by our giving to Him. Now, do you realize if you, any official, if you offer money for favor, it's bribery and you can go to jail. Isn't that right? And the official that accepts it goes to jail. Right? And yet here it's been practiced and endorsed constantly. Now, you have to think of some of this. We always say, well, God doesn't have favorites. Yes, He does. Do you realize that every Christian is God's favorite? Isn't it right? Because what is favorite? Well, okay, you got the Ammonites, the Hittites. Well, we got the favorites. Right? We got God's favor. Right? We are those who have the favor of God. Right? Not by what we do or effort, but because of who He is. Right? So we are the favorites. So you say, God didn't have favorites? Oh, excuse me. I'm, I'm one. You know, isn't that right? Yeah. <clears throat> it says, now, ministers who teach this give-to-get doctrine and TV hosts who invite them on their telethons need to heed the warning of the Apostle James. Let not many of you become teachers knowing that we shall be, receive a stricter judgment. James 3, 1. <clears throat> now, that was the end of his, but, and I'm just going to add this. Acts chapter 8, verse 17. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon, the sorcerer here, saw that through laying on of, hand, of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Your money perish with you, because you have thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Now, it, aren't the, isn't that what you're told? Isn't that what's preached on television? They, with the, now, what's the difference? If you can get healing, blessing, prosperity, all, you know, all that stuff, Aren't those all blessings of the Holy Ghost? Isn't that where it comes through? And what's the difference between offering money for the blessing or offering money to get the person that brings the blessing? Wouldn't I mean, isn't it just as bad? So what we have to realize is that that's what's going on in the church. And, that, and the worst part is, it is absolutely accepted. Matter of fact, we've been doing the TV programs this week. And you know what our biggest concern is? is the fact that we're even going to be allowed to be on because we're preaching Bible and because what we're preaching so contradicts what we heard the last time we were up there that we're wondering if they're even going to let us on. Really. Because that is generally what is taught. 
And so, y'all be praying for us that we actually get on and stay on. <clears throat> now, he says, your money perish with you. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter. For your heart is not right in the sight of God. See, now see, it's one thing for preacher to be saying, but also those that are in the pews that think they can buy it. Now, I know they're, buy, they're doing that because they're taught that. So the real wrong goes back to the teachers that are teaching it. But it still said, your heart's not right if you think you can buy it. So they're being led astray. Blind guides leading the blind, and they're both falling into the ditch. <clears throat> Repent, therefore, of this wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven you. For I perceive that you're in, in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which you have spoken come upon me. At least he had a turnaround there. The teachers today don't even have to turn around in that. Now, is that it? I think that's it. Yes. Yeah, okay. I want to make sure he's right there. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> just about finished. <laughs> Get all the stuff out of my way. Ezekiel 34. Ezekiel 34. And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, verse 1, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? Now, first off, let me tell you this. Ezekiel is talking and even prophesying at this point, because I'll show you where he starts to prophesy. But he's saying, God is saying this. Now, obviously, this is, when was Ezekiel? 400 B.C., roughly through there? Four, four or six? Six? Somewhere, 200. Oh, come on. We're talking a couple of thousand years ago, so a couple of hundred years ain't going to matter. <clears throat> but roughly, okay. And during that time, he was talking to them, and I know he wasn't talking to us, prophesying to us, all right? It was Ezekiel to the people of Israel in bondage at that time in Babylon, okay? Now, but we can learn the principle, right? And that's all I'm going to look at at this point. <clears throat> he says, Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? You eat the fat, and you, and you clothe you with the wool. You kill them that are fed, but you feed not the flock. The diseased have you not strengthened, neither have you healed that which was sick. Neither have you bound up that which was broken, neither have you brought again that which was driven away, neither have you sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have you ruled them. And they were scattered because there is no shepherd. Now, But it says, right, he called them shepherds, right? He said, but they're scattered because there is no shepherd. What's he saying? They're called shepherds, but there's no real ones, right? Nobody really doing the job. He says, now, now another thing is, you, you think if that's possible back then, you think it could be possible today? Isn't that right? Because men's hearts don't change unless they're changed by the Spirit of God. Right? People don't change. God creates new ones. Okay? Do you get that? <laughs> new creation, new ones? Okay. <clears throat> and they, and it says, and they were scattered because there is no shepherd, and they became meat to all the beasts of the field. Now, just kind of think for a minute what he's talking about here. He said, look, there's no shepherd, so they're scattered. People leave church, don't go back to church, don't want nothing to do with church. And it says, what happens when you do that? Here's what happens. You become meat to the beasts of the field. Why? Because you're alone by yourself, end up falling away. It just all kind of, and, I, and again, I don't want to put too much into this, but I'm just going to show you just a brief analogy, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me, getting dry. <clears throat> now, he says, My sheep wandered through all the mountains and upon every high hill. Yea, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock became a prey, and my flock became meat to every beast of the field, because there was no shepherd, neither did my shepherd search my, for my flock, but the shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease 
from feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more. <clears throat> For I will deliver my flock from their mouth. Boy, that could be taken several ways. What comes out of the mouth but the teaching which defiles? Or in there, right? Okay. <clears throat> from their mouth that they may not be meat for them. For thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I'll bring them out, of, out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited places of the country. I will feed them in a good pasture and upon the high mountains of Israel shall, be their, shall their fold be. There shall they lie in a good fold and in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. I will seek that which was lost, bring again that which was driven away, bind up that was broken, and will strengthen that which was sick. Strengthen meaning heal. But I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. And as for you, O my flock, thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I judge between cattle and cattle between the rams and the he-goats. Seemeth it a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture, but you must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures? In other words, it's not that you're eating, but now you're even walking on the other stuff so nobody else can eat. That's what he's trying to get back. And he's saying all these things going on. Now he's saying, I'm talking to these shepherds, but I'm also talking to the sheep and telling you, you are fat, you, are, you, you have gathered all this to yourself, and matter of fact, you're not on, you're just you're feeding yourself, you're devouring it for yourself, and you're not even leaving others. You're not taking what you got out to others. He says, <clears throat> and to have drunk of the deep waters, but you must foul the residue with your feet. And as, in other words, you only think about yourself. You're not thinking about others. And as for my flock, they eat that which was trodden with your feet, and they drink that which you have fouled with your feet. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and the lean cattle. Because you have thrust with side and with your shoulder and pushed all the disease with your horns till you have scattered them abroad. Therefore will I save my flock and they shall no more be a prey and I will judge between cattle and cattle and I will set up one shepherd over them. Now this, this is proven, this is prophesying. And he shall feed them even my servant David. Now, David lived 600 years before this. So he obviously was not talking about King David, but he was talking about the seed of David. Now watch, he says, He shall feed them and shall be their shepherd. Well, who is the shepherd? Jesus. King David lived 400 years before Ezekiel, so obviously it's about Jesus. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David, a prince among them, and I, the Lord, have spoken it. I will make with them a covenant of peace. And will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land. They will shall dwell safely <clears throat> and sleep in the wilderness and sleep in the woods. I'll make them and the place around about my hill a blessing. I'll cause the shower to come down in his season. Now, and there shall be showers of blessings. Now, do you see, I don't know if you caught this. Do you notice when the blessing came and all the showers came? It's whenever David, Jesus, was set over them as a shepherd. Not when they started giving. And they're right? When this shepherd is their shepherd, they are blessed. Why? Because of their shepherd. And then what he's going back to? Shepherds, you're not feeding them. If you're not blessed, why is that? It's the shepherd's fault. Do you get that? He's saying you've got to feed them real stuff. And he said, but whenever Jesus comes and he's your shepherd, then you will be blessed and all these things are going to come to pass. And the tree of the field shall yield their fruit and the earth shall yield their increase and they will be safe in the land and they'll know that I'm the Lord. When I have broken the bands of their yoke, well, what, what is that? What breaks the bands of the yoke? The anointing. Who's the anointed one? Do you have an anointing yet? See, all this ties in together. And he says, <clears throat> and deliver them out of the hand of those that serve themselves of them. So it talks about being delivered out of the hands of these shepherds that are just devouring them, devouring widows' houses. Do, is, is, do you see this? When I started going through this, I kept thinking, 
first off, it's going to be too long a message, but how can I cut it off? It just kept coming. He says, Then I will raise them, I will raise up for them a plant of renown. They will be no more consumed with hunger in the land, neither shall bear the shame of the heathen any more. Thus shall they know that I, the Lord their God, am with them, and that they, even the house of Israel, are my people, saith the Lord God. And you, my flock, the flock of my pasture, are men, and I am your God, saith the Lord God. Now, during, now here's, we're, we're finishing. <laughs> during Christopher Columbus's day, there were people who believed that the earth was flat. Isn't that right? Now, have we proven beyond a shadow of a doubt the, the earth is not flat? Very true, right? When we got photos from space. Which, of course, there's people that said that that didn't happen either. People don't believe that we landed on the moon, that it was all on a you know, Hollywood set and all, all this stuff. It's amazing. But the funny thing is, okay, if the earth is flat, how come nobody's ever fallen off? All right? Nobody's ever fallen off. Yeah, I was there. He went and he's gone and we looked over the edge and they were gone. No, that never happened. But do you realize that was during Columbus's day? And you know there's still a flat earth society today? No, there is a there's a group called the Flat Earth Society. They are vehement about the fact that the earth is flat and you can't prove them different. Right? Now, as Kenneth Hagin used to say, that is just ignorance going to seed. All right? I mean, that's just, it's, it is in good ground and growing, okay? Now, <clears throat> let me ask you this. They were wrong in Christopher Columbus's day, and they're wrong today, right? They're not right. So there are people that actually believe stuff that aren't right. Right? Right. Okay. Now, when Martin Luther saw the problems in the Catholic Church, he made a decision to stand by that truth. Isn't it right? No matter what he added. Now, when he made that, when he saw that, there was Martin Luther, there was the Catholic Church. One was right, one was wrong. Right? Now, just this, I guess you could say this is opinion, but just for the sake of opinion, who was right? Martin Luther, right? Okay. Who was wrong? At that time, the Catholic Church was selling donors. Now, who had the most numbers? The Catholic Church. Vastly outnumbered him, right? More numbers, more buildings, more money, more everything, right? Still wrong, right? right? So numbers, money, all the things that we say today are the blessing of the Lord. Okay, In this magazine, there's articles about Ted Haggard. And they're talking about people writing about him and saying, how, you know, how could God bless this man? who was, has said he struggled with his sin all of his life, and yet God blessed him with a 15 or 14,000 member church. Okay, my first question is, who said God blessed him? Who said that God built that thing? You understand what I'm saying? I'm not bashing them. I'm just saying, we think because there's big numbers that that's the blessing of God? No, it, it could be. Not, I'm not saying this is about him or anything else. I'm, there's other churches just as big and bigger. It has nothing to do with the blessing of God. Most Christian television is not on because of God. It's because people are foolish enough to keep giving to it and keep it going. Same thing with most large churches. Not, I'm not that little churches are better than large churches, all right? I'm not saying that at all. But I'm saying the, the reason things keep going... Okay, if you're going to say that numbers mean the blessing of God, then we can fellowship anywhere. We can fellowship down at the Mormon uh, you know, temple. We can, we can fellowship down at the Jehovah Witness Kingdom Hall because they got numbers. Isn't it right? They're all over the world. So we're going to have to decide what the true blessing of God is and not just look at numbers and money and that kind of thing because there's a lot of rich groups out there that are, I mean, come on, Scientology? Look how big, how much money. They own almost all of Hollywood Boulevard. And that's some pretty expensive uh, real estate. Amen? But yet they're wrong, right? right. So money, all that stuff to me. Okay. Now, who are we at? Yeah. <clears throat> At that moment, there were those who were right and there were those who were wrong. There was always two sides to every argument, right? To some degree. But usually, each party has some degree of truth. It's like on a sliding scale, okay? Usually. It's not always clear cut. But when you distill it down to its essence, there will be a right position and a wrong position, okay? I could give you all kinds of arguments about... Uh, uh, you know, pro-life, pro-choice. I mean, the, both sides have arguments, right? I mean, they both have their own arguments they think are right. But when you get down to it, bottom line is, what is the result? Life or death? So really, you get down to it. It's a real simple decision. Isn't it right? Real simple. Somebody's right, somebody's wrong. Now, great movements 
forward in the kingdom of God have always been made by people, I'm, I'm reading this the way I got it, who found and embraced a truth and have been willing to pay the price for standing by that truth. There has never been a movement that didn't fit that. All right? So if you're going to be part of a movement of God, you're going to pay a price for it. Not, not for God to bless you with it, but to the people around you that's going to persecute you because of it. Okay? In times past, truth cost them their lives. In more recent times, it cost people their associations. Today, it'll cost your associations, your reputations. Sometimes it'll mean having to leave something that you have put your whole life and work into. Your whole life. But when one truth can make you go, you know what? I got to leave it right. and walk away from it. No matter what, you, I don't care who you are. You know, there was a guy that was in the Jehovah's Witnesses, one of the top people that found out that they were wrong and had to leave it. And he became kind of the poster boy and for a while. But the sad part is, or the good part is, he was, he was honest enough that when he found truth, he went with it, no matter what it cost him. Now, Man, actually I've already said some of this, man is a group-oriented individual. Most truly great achievements are conceived by one person, but brought about by a small committed group that enlists the masses to spread the vision. Let me give you an example. Parham had the Pentecostal message. He passed it on to Seymour. Seymour then put it into a small group, Azusa Street, and then it went around the world and became the charismatic Pentecostal movement. Right? Real simple. That's the way it usually is. <clears throat> when we are a part of a crowd, we feel safe because we're lost in anonymity. In other words, if they're going to shoot at us, there's a good chance we won't get hit. They'll hit somebody else. Okay? That's what it comes down to. Now, we assume that the larger the crowd, the more right we must be. Yet we know and constantly reaffirm that we believe the opposite. Small group, lack of... I already talked about this. The truths that I teach here have not been taught for almost 100 years. And matter of fact, some of them God is giving revelation on that have never been taught that I've heard. Now, <coughs> but the fact, <coughs> man, but the fact, but the, sound like Walter Brennan there for a minute. <coughs> but the fact that we have not, that they have not been taught does not make them any less right. Right? Just the fact that a truth has been forgotten doesn't mean that it's still not a truth. Now, we are fulfilling prophecy every day that we're moving forward with what we're teaching now I'll, I'll prove it to you <clears throat> the reason we have this ministry many of you know is because of Dr. Lake's prophecy in 34 that Wilfred Wright believed that I fit <clears throat> here's what parts of it says now you got to remember this has been around since 34 he said there shall come upon the earth great darkness the ground gained from the enemy shall be lost and false teachers shall arise and false prophets whose words shall have a ring of truth but will have no substance. They are those who will follow after gain and greed shall be their God. They shall show forth works but their visions will not exalt me, saith God, but their own selves and doctrines. Against this, there shall come forth by my spirit a young man. Now, this was given to Lake because to carry on his ministry. Another voice crying in the wilderness to make straight the way of the Lord, restoring old ways and shoring up the terrible gap in the wall to stop the incoming flood of sin and worldliness that will, shall surely be in the church in that day. This one will be rejected of men and his brethren will not understand nor accept him. I will fill him with my spirit and with my mind. His life will be precious to me for his spirit will bring forth from my spirit and show his generation of my fullness. He shall be born when the country has stopped growing for I will bring him forth in the very last days. He shall consecrate himself to me even as he was consecrated as a child. He will not hearken to the voices that would hinder him for he is separated under the work whereunto I have called him. He will dwell upon me night and day and I will remove any hindrances that will place itself against my purposes. I will use him mightily, for he shall not only continue the flow of this ministry, but he shall carry it to even greater depths. The great works that have been seen 
will appear as not, for I will do greater works, for he is meek and seeks peace. I will cause the pride of life to pass from him, and the spirit of achievement instilled in him at an early age I will cause to leave. <clears throat> the enemy will try to kill him a score in five years from my death, from the date of my death. Before his second score of years, he shall see all these things begin, thus saith the Lord. Now, you heard that first part about teachers rising up, false visions, going after gain, greed. you got to remember, this was 1934. Back when the Pentecostal movement was still strong, still good things. Now, <clears throat> and there's several other things in there that fit as, uh, even what we're talking about today. Now, finishing up, we're either right or wrong. Those that... Now, you have to understand. Remember what I said earlier when I was quoting Jesus and the things he said? Just He just said them, right? Didn't explain them, just said them, and it was either yes or no. <clears throat> Those that say the opposite are either right or wrong. We're either right or wrong, they're right or wrong. Right? right. We both can't be right. Mm -hmm. it, it cannot happen. Now, I'm not saying that they're not saved or that they're not Christian. Do you understand that? I'm not saying, any, I'm, you know, not saying that at all. <clears throat> I'm not judging what they're doing necessarily, or, you know, well, I'm judging what they're doing, but I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt that they're just deceived. <clears throat> but if they are right, then we need to change and begin saying what they're saying. Right? I mean, they wouldn't, I mean if they're right. But if we're right, then we have a responsibility to do everything within our power to spread this message. Right? Because it's not just, well, this is what we believe, this is our group. What? See, the church is absolutely embalmed with this spiritual relativism. You know, or, uh, you know, where, oh, well, that's right, you know, uh, situational ethics, that kind of thing. Well, that's all right for you. You know, that's where you're at. But, that, but that's not right for me because it's... You know, no, it's either right or wrong. It's either right for everybody, and if it's right for everybody, then the opposite is wrong for everybody. Right. You understand that? Yes. It's either black or white. There's no variables, no shadow of turning. There's nothing. God either is or he is not, right? There's no. Ch That's what we've got to realize. It, <clears throat> we have been given a dispensation of the gospel. God has given us, according to everybody that's heard this message, they've looked at it and Honestly, I've asked them to tear it apart and they've all come back and said, this is right, there's nothing we can do about it, and there's nothing we can tear it apart in. <clears throat> but we have this dispensation of the gospel and we've got to be faithful to believe it and to preach it. Everybody in this room, everybody that knows it. That's why, you know, I, I don't go around being, you know, the apostle, the anointed one, and, and everybody has to get in. Not that. This is about raising up the body of Christ till we all look like Jesus. Yeah. Right? We have, yeah, if we do not do this, if we do not, you know, it's like, was it, um, who was it? I guess it was, uh, what are you living for? What, you know, is what you're That's it, that's it. Is what we're living for worth Christ's suffering? In other words, what are you, what are you living for? What do you do? Where, where's your head? What do you, what do you think? Well, I, I'm working to pay the bills. Is that what you're living for? You understand? I mean, I know you got bills. I know you got to work. I understand that. But what is your motivating factor? Yeah. You know, what, what pushes you? Yeah. What are you doing? You know, if you're working, you're working okay, but what, what is your spare time? Is it sitting in front of the television constantly? You know, are you on, you know, the preferred customer list at Blockbuster? You know what I'm saying? Well, what are we doing? You know, they, they send you notices, you know. <laughs> when you're not there after two days, you know, where are you at? What happened? <clears throat> and they send a wreath because they figure you're dead, you know. <clears throat> so, where, that, what I'm trying to say is, what are we living for? We either, and, and honestly, we either believe this or we don't. We either do it or we don't. Yes. If we don't, if we, now, get this, if we believe this and we don't do it, this is what I got. If we believe it and we don't do it, if not, we are no different than the Pharisees that taught one thing and lived something else. They promoted a doctrine that did not govern their lives. Is that what we do? 
No heaven ordained message will allow you to straddle a fence. If it's from heaven, it makes you get off the fence on one side or the other. There is no, there are no, there are absolute. Jesus always demands instant and absolute obedience to truth. Not, not grow, say again, at relativism. Well, well, I'm getting there. I'm God's greenhouse. And, you know, you think you're going to get it all figured out and then you're going to step over? No, you believe. And when you step over, revelation comes. That's the way it comes. You, you can't straddle the fence. You, you can't, you've got to be on one side or the other. It demands absolute obedience and surrender to truth. I've been, I've been to other churches on Sunday morning. I was going to one for regular. And I have the same, just what I wrote, I just wrote down exactly. I have the same religious cravings every Sunday morning you do. You know, to get up and go be a part of a church. There's good worship and there's this. And, and to be in the thing, you know. That's, that, that's ingrained to it. If you've been in church very long, I was raised in church, you know, to some degree. And it's just ingrained. Sunday morning, you get up, you get it. And whenever we don't have a Sunday morning service, then you're thinking, where should I go? What? That's natural. You know, very natural. Not spiritual, natural. Okay? Now, but this is the thing. And this is one I'm not going to, and I'm not telling you not to go anywhere else anymore. And that's your business. All right? I'm, not, I'm telling you in my life. This is what's going on with me. I was going to another church, visiting, enjoyed it, liked it, you know. And had to filter out a little bit. Probably the least I've ever had to filter out of any church I went to. So I was pretty happy there. But I've learned that I can't mix messages. Because if I'm not moving forward, I'm moving back. Anything that isn't solidifying this message and renewing... I've spent years renewing my mind to this. And then little things tend to soften it. And I don't want that. I want to... And not that I want to be the strict legal... You know, Pharisee, but I want to be right where God wants me to be in the fullness of truth, walking in what I know. And I know that most places where I go, they're not going to help me walk in what I know. They're going to give me reasons why I don't have to, to be very honest with you. The mindset caused me to lose ground in my mind renewal process. Now, somebody's right, somebody's wrong. Simple as that. We must preach and practice repentance. As a lifestyle, right? Constant. Not a one-time, constant. We must preach and practice holy living before God and man. Right? No option, right or wrong. We must preach and live like we believe in a real hell and that men and women are actually going there unless we reach them. We've got to live that way. All right? All these are constants. Not every now and then, constants. And next... We must preach and practice the new covenant, not the old covenant. That's what makes it hard going to a lot of other churches in the morning. is because of that old covenant, new covenant mindset. Now, and, and the bad part is, you got this groupings in the church now that makes us, a lot of the movements have not swung to the new covenant side. And so you go there and even though what God's trying to do is, is good and working people out and but they're, he's having to filter it to an old covenant mindset and you're getting a bunch of stuff that won't work. And they see through old covenant mindsets and it interprets things wrong. Just like the Pharisees interpreted Jesus wrong. They thought they could stop him. And they didn't even see that he was the fulfillment of everything they preached. He said, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. And they would rather have the scriptures than the fulfillment. And today, people would rather have Old Testament scriptures than the fulfillment of the New Covenant. They'd rather walk in those shadows and types and all that kind of stuff and, and no details and be able to be real spiritual sounding rather than just walk in the simplicity of the gospel, which is to know Christ and Him crucified and nothing else. That's the New Covenant. We must preach and practice healing from a New Covenant position as sons and daughters, not beggar children or beggar servants. We must be bold in proclaiming and demonstrating what God has done in us through the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. I heard a man even on television this morning say, everybody else is coming out of the closet. It's time for you to come out. Isn't that right? Why should we be ashamed of being a Christian? It's time to be bold. time to come out of the closet. You know, we don't want to be like Nicodemus and come to Jesus by night. 
or Josephus, or Josephus, <coughs> Joseph of Arimathea, who for fear of the Jews wouldn't openly follow Jesus. <clears throat> like the Apostle Paul, we must forget who we were and what we have done. And we must know that it is no longer I that live, but Christ Jesus who lives in me and through me. That's it. Amen? Amen. Somebody's right. Somebody's wrong. If we're right, let's live like it. If we're wrong, let's change quick. Right? Go jump in there and... <clears throat> you know, I, it's funny because in the TV program, it's amazing. I mean, it, 30 minutes goes real quick. Real quick. Right? Especially for me. It goes real quick. And yet, it's amazing how much time you have when you're not having to beg for money. Because we're not, we haven't even asked for money on the TV program. We had none. I mean, we're just preaching. And I even told him that at one point. I said, "You know why I can tell you the truth? Because I'm not trying to get anything out of you. See, we're paying for this program. We don't, we don't. We're not asking anybody to pay for it. We're paying for it. And as we pay for it, then we can tell them the truth. And I told him, I said, "We're going to tell you the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. So help me God. Simple as that. And we're getting truth out there." You know, and now I'm ready to do episodes five, six, seven. I'm like, got this lined up. Generational curses. Can we talk about that? Can we talk, you know, all these different faith for others. And, you know, we're shooting it right there in, into Tulsa. So it are just butt heads right on with some of that stuff. <laughs> so now we've been talking about revolution. And that's the reason I brought these. <clears throat> I'm not selling these. I'm just telling you, it's out there. People are calling. Men of God. Michael Brown has wrote both these books. But you go walk. I, I challenge you to go to a Christian bookstore. And just look at titles and see how many titles you find with the words revolution in them. Right now. It is amazing. And it's because everybody that is spiritual, that is hearing the voice of God, knows that it is time for a revolution. It is time for a complete change. The bad part is the people that are calling for it, some of the most and the loudest, have no clue about what it's going to be. Because when it comes, they're going to go, whoa, 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 this isn't, this isn't what, I, what I was calling for. I want nice neat. I want organization and I want all... No, no, no. It's not going to be that way. Revolution is chaotic. It always is. That's why... And where Jesus went, he caused a riot. The early disciples, they caused riots. They caused tumults. They caused all these things. They caused the authorities to take notice. And yet, we act as though we can have the same power, same works, all this kind of... Oh, it'll be good. And yet, we're not going to draw anybody's attention? We're not going to draw any persecution? Are you kidding me? Well, the biggest persecution we're going to have is the same biggest persecution Jesus had. Religious Pharisees that are afraid of losing their position and afraid of losing money. And I guarantee you, you watch once. We've already had some people there in Tulsa say, I don't want to hear anything about that DHT stuff. I don't want it. Why? Because they're afraid they're going to have to change and their people are going to hear it and they're going to start saying, hey, wait a minute. This disagrees with what you've been teaching us. And so we, we're, we're getting that already. I, I can imagine what we're going to get when we start hitting people <laughs> about the money. But I'm telling you, it's either truth or it's not. So, all we have to do now is make a decision. What are we going to do? We're going to live it? Or is this just another message where, you know, I got to sit there and listen to Curry drone on for two hours? See, this isn't about preaching. This is about, this. we can change Christianity to the way God wants it to be. You see, Curry, that sounds so arrogant for you to say that. That's what Parham said. That's what Lake said. That's what all these people said. That's what Martin Luther said. And the only people that would say other are the cowards and the timid that Revelation talks about. It's time to stand up. Stand what you believe. We'll, <laughs> it's all either hang together or we will all surely hang separately. Yeah. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so, all right, let's all stand up. Oh, yeah. Oh, I'll, I'll get it here in a second. Let's pray. We're going to pray, and then we're going to take up the offering and all that stuff. Get everything done. So, Father, in Jesus' name. Father, I have delivered your word exactly the way you gave it to me, and, Lord, I believe it's your word. <clears throat> Father, I just ask one thing, and that is that by your power, by your ability, that you would allow this message on CD and DVD and any other form, word of mouth, whatever, to just 
spread throughout Christianity. Lord, let it hit, let it go to every household. Let it go to, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Lord, we are not in agreement with the way that the church has been going and the way it is going. And Lord, we're saying change it. And Lord, we're willing to be used to change it even at the cost of our life, our, our careers, our reputations, our finances, everything. Because nothing matters if we don't have truth and have your spirit. We've, we, Lord, we have to worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we... <clears throat> I just say just bring down the false and put in the true. Set your people free, Lord, from so-called shepherds that are teaching stuff, Lord, that you would never say and they're doing it in your name. They're making gain into godliness. And Lord, we say it's time for the church to rise up. Lord, I would ask you to bless Brother Ravenhill. Bless his column. Let it go forth. Lord, let it cause a stir. And Lord, give him boldness, as you have. And Lord, give him words to say in the next issue that will continue this right on. And we will continue hammering against the wall of error until it comes down. We thank you for it. Lord, comfort him. Give him strength in areas where he may think, what am I doing? Should I be saying this? Lord, I say in the name of Jesus, bless him, encourage him, embolden him in the name of Jesus. So be it. Amen. 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 All right, we're going to go ahead and take up the offering real quick, get that done, and then we're going to pray. We've got a list of just a few, a few names, a few names.